All right, at this time, I'm going to invite you to take your Bible and turn to the book of Psalms, Psalm 46. It seems I find myself preaching out of the Psalms quite often. That's not necessarily by design, at least not by my design. Uh, hopefully it is of the Lord's, but uh, sometimes you read through, through uh, the Psalms, and I don't know about you, but I, I've read through the Psalms multiple times, and, uh, and every time it seems that there's something that just jumps off the page at me, and, and it's like, boy, I don't think I've ever read that before. And I know I have, uh, but it just doesn't seem like it. It seems like there's some truth there that just kind of uh, hits home in a way that it hasn't, and, uh, and so it can be a real blessing. And, and uh, this would be one of those, uh, as I was reading uh, through the Psalms once again in Psalm 46, and I want to go ahead and, and read this whole chapter here. It's only 11 verses We'll start off in verse number one. God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. Therefore will we not fear, though the earth be removed, and though the mountains be carried into the midst of the sea, though the waters thereof roar and be troubled, though the mountains shake with the swelling thereof, Selah. There is a river, the streams whereof shall make glad the city of God, the holy place of the tabernacles, of the Most High. God is in the midst of her. She shall not be moved. God shall help her, and that right early. The heathen raged. The kingdoms were moved. He uttered his voice. The earth melted. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our refuge. Selah. Come, behold the works of the Lord, what desolations he hath made in the earth. He maketh wars to cease unto the end of the earth. He breaketh the bow and cutteth the spear in sunder. He burneth the chariot in the fire. Be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the heathen. I will be exalted in the earth. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our refuge. Selah. I want to preach to you tonight on the Bible answer for anxiety. You may not read that and, and get that right, right off the top of your head, that this uh, particular passage of Scripture would deal with the issue of anxiety. But really, uh, as we look at it, I think you'll find that there actually is a very clear prescription in here for dealing with worries and fears. Did you know that anxiety, according to psychiatrists and psychologists, anxiety is the most common mental health issue uh, in, in the world today, especially within the American society. In fact, uh, it's sad that 40 million Americans deal with anxiety. That's about 20%, roughly 20% of our population. That's a lot. That's a lot. That would mean that a good number of people in this room have experienced or dealt with or struggled with anxiety at times, fear and worry. And, and maybe some are dealing with that even now. And then along with that, kind of a, a companion uh, uh, issue that goes along with that is depression. Most people who deal with anxiety also deal with depression and vice versa. They just kind of go hand in hand. The reality is we live very stressed out lives, don't we? Constantly busy, constant pressure, uh, deadlines, and, and, and just busyness. And, and, and it seems like the, the more that we advance technologically, the more pressures there are uh, on our lives. And that often brings about and, and just helps kind of foster uh, that, that fear and worry within us. And, of course, then we have the issue that uh, there's... There's media constantly bombarding us with information, and much of it is false information or at least skewed, but a lot of times that information is, is troublesome and worrisome. And uh, you read the newspaper or, or, uh, or, or watch the news on TV or read it online or whatever the case is, and there's always that question, what's going to be tomorrow, you know? What's going to be the outcome of this situation? You know, I think of... Um, 
For instance, this whole uh, struggle with, uh, with North Korea that we're dealing with as a nation and, and the, the tension that's there. And, and there's always that kind of wondering, well, what, what happens, you know, if things boil over? Uh, we've got uh, some people in control on, well, really on either side of the issue that, uh, boy, it's a little shaky whether they know what they're doing, you know. And, uh, and things, could, things could get really bad at any time. In fact, in a lot of ways, things are bad all, you know, all the time in, in certain places in the world. And, and you never know when, when that day is going to come, uh, when, you, when, when things just fall apart for you. And, uh, and so we can, we can live our lives constantly in fear and in worry about tomorrow and what might be, uh, constantly stressed out, constantly uh, uh, worried and, and anxious about things. And while this is a very common problem, I want you to know that it is not God's will for you and I to live that way. It just is not God's will. In fact, we could even say, and you may think this is a bit of an extreme statement, but we could say that to live with fear and worry and anxiety is sin. It is sin. Now, that's not to deny the reality of it. I understand that people struggle with this, and, 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 and some people are just kind of uh, almost in bondage to it. In fact, the Bible talks about uh, being in bondage to fear. And I understand that it's a very real struggle and a very real issue and problem, but that doesn't negate the fact that biblically, to live our lives with fear and worry and anxiety is sinful. I want to read some scripture to you. We don't have time to turn to all these places. But I want to read some things to you that might help you to begin thinking about this in a biblical sense. Uh, the first place would be 2 Timothy 1.7, which says, For God hath not given us the spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. Now that verse in itself tells us that fear doesn't originate from God. It is not of the Lord. It's not something that God has put within us. We can determine from that then that if it doesn't come from God, it must come either from Satan or from our flesh. But either way, usually things that come from Satan or from the flesh are not good. And and so it does not come from God. Uh, Romans 14, verse 23 says, For whatsoever is not of faith is sin. You cannot be living by faith and walking by faith and yet crippled by fear. The two are incompatible. They don't work together. And whatsoever is not of faith is sin. In Matthew chapter 6, in verse 34, Jesus told his disciples, Take therefore no thought for the morrow, for the morrow shall take thought for the things of itself. Sufficient unto the day is the evil thereof. In other words, don't worry about what tomorrow holds. Don't be fearful of what could come your way tomorrow. Sufficient unto the day is the evil thereof. Just focus on today. Uh, You don't have to worry about what tomorrow is going to hold. And then, of course, there's a famous verse, Philippians 4, 6, which says, Take, uh, which says, Be careful for nothing, but in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your request be made known unto God. Be careful for nothing. Don't be uh, filled with care about anything. Don't be worried. Don't be troubled. Don't be anxious about life. And then a more serious verse would be, Revelation 21 and verse number 8, where a list of sins is given that are are, are kind of uh, explained to us the the reasons that people ultimately will spend eternity separated from God, those who are cast into the lake of fire. And the very first on that list says this, but the fearful and unbelieving and the abominable and murderers and whoremongers and sorcerers and idolaters And all liars shall have their part in the lake which burneth with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. Uh, That list of these these grievous sins that that ultimately condemn us and send us to a Christless eternity in the lake of fire, the reason that happens, the first one mentioned on that list is those who are fearful. In other words, God doesn't look quite as lightly on this issue as we might. And so it's important for us to understand that God doesn't want us to live our lives in fear. It's the enemy of our faith, and we are to live by faith and walk by faith and not by sight. And as we read here in Psalm 46, we actually find 
a, a prescription, an answer, uh, the way that we deal with anxiety and fear in our lives. And the first, the first one we actually find in verse number 1, and it is this, we recognize our security. We have to recognize our security. Notice this, he says, God is our refuge and strength. A very present help in trouble. Verse 2, listen to this. Therefore will we not fear. I don't have to worry and I don't have to fear because I know who my refuge is. I know where my help comes from. I know where I find safety. It is in God. It is in the Lord, the one who made the heaven and the earth. Notice in verse number 7, the Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our refuge. The same thing is said in verse number 11. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our refuge. I am not forgetting who it is that I'm trusting in. You know, it it occurs to me that when, when we become fearful, when we're controlled by worry and by anxiety, that the reason for that is we've forgotten, at least maybe not, uh, you know, in our minds as we would, we would think to, to say, yes, I totally forgot who my help comes from. But really, in essence, we are, we are living in such a way that we say, I've forgotten who really is my help, who really is my safety, that, that, that I have a, a place of refuge, that I have a place where I can trust in the Lord. It is the Lord of hosts. It's the God of the universe. That is the one where I find my strength. It's the one where I find my help. So no matter what comes my way, I know that I already have one up on whatever circumstances or whatever enemy I might face today because the one who is helping me is greater than anything I could face. Greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. I have a refuge and it is God It's the one who's in control of everything. I want you to hold your place here. Go with me, if you would, please, to Proverbs chapter number 3. Proverbs chapter 3. And there are some verses here that are are, uh, very famous, verses 5 and 6 of Proverbs 3. And and most of us could probably quote these. But I want you to pay special attention to some of the words in here. Uh, Proverbs 3, verse 5 says, Trust in the Lord with all thine heart. And lean not unto thine own understanding. Trust with all thine heart. My wife, who is dear and precious to me, does not drive when I'm in the car. And there's a reason for that. Usually, if I were to let her drive, it would be because I'm trying to sleep. But I found that I can't sleep when she drives. I'll just leave it at that. And it's not that I don't trust her, necessarily, because I certainly do. Uh, But it is this issue where I can't say with absolute confidence that I trust with all my heart that we are going to arrive safely. And so because of that, I often find it necessary personally within myself to sit there and help watch. And though I don't try to be a backseat driver, I like to be an extra set of eyes in case she misses something. And uh, and I want to be able to offer that help if need be. However, if I were to trust with all my heart, I should be able to sleep like a baby, right? Absolute confidence. If we're trusting God with all of our heart, you know we have no reason to fear. We absolutely have no reason to fear. We have no reason to lose sleep over anything that could come our way because God's in control. He's our refuge. He is our help. And then I want you to notice verse number 6. First we're to trust with all our heart, but then in verse number 6 it says, In all thy ways acknowledge him. You know, sometimes I I, I believe that we fail to acknowledge God. We fail to recognize in every situation, in all thy ways, no matter what comes, to acknowledge God in it. 
That means when a, a problem comes our way, we're able to say, you know what? God's in control of this. And the reason that this is happening is because God is allowing it to happen. And it must be within His will to allow me to go through this for one reason or another. Maybe it's to help grow me in, in my faith. Maybe it's to help uh, purge out some kind of sin in my life. Maybe it's so that others, so that I can be a testimony and a witness to others. Maybe it's so that God can uh, use me. There's, he's giving an opportunity to be used of Him. And whatever comes my way, I can trust and acknowledge that God is in it. We're to recognize our security. But then as we go back to Psalm 46, we find not only are we to recognize our security, we also to need to remember His sovereignty. And this, this, isn't, this might sound similar, but I want you to watch this. He says in verse number 2, Therefore will we not fear, though the earth be removed, and though the mountains be carried into the midst of the sea, though the waters thereof roar and be troubled, though the mountains shake with the swelling thereof. No matter what happens, regardless of what circumstances could come our way, we will not fear. Think about this. If tomorrow, this isn't just poetic language. This is literal. This is what he says. Therefore will we not fear, though the earth be removed, and, the mount, and though the mountains be carried into the midst of the sea. What would you do tomorrow if you woke up and the news was that the Rocky Mountains had fallen off, there had been some kind of an earthquake, and they were cast into the sea? That would be a troubling thing, would it not? I mean, the earth that we live in is falling apart. And you say, well, that couldn't happen. Well, we don't know what could happen, okay? Uh, think of the flood of 4,000 years ago. That messed some things up in the earth, okay? I mean, it really changed the landscape. God can do some amazing things. But if that were to happen tomorrow, would you be fearful? I think it'd be natural for some of us to go, wow, look at all this. I mean, some, some catastrophic earthquake takes place and it brings some fear. Can you imagine if the mountains were cast into the sea? He says, we have no reason to fear. Look at verse number 8. It says, come, behold the works of the Lord. I love that phrase, by the way. Come here, let me show you something. Let me show you what God did. Come, behold the works of the Lord, what desolations he hath made in the earth. He maketh wars to cease from the end of the earth. He breaketh the bow and cutteth the spear in sunder. He burneth the chariot in the fire. He says, listen, God does all of this. Not only did he create the heaven and the earth, but he also, verse number 9, maketh wars to cease unto the end of the earth. Do you know that God, at any time, could declare world peace? And it would be so. By the way, he will. And that is coming someday soon, when Christ returns to this earth and sets up his kingdom... And world peace is not just some pipe dream that we talk about and wish for and hope for. It will become a reality. And by His very presence and by the word of His mouth, all wars and all contentions cease. And you know what? He breaketh the bow and cutteth the spear in sunder. Did you know that God is able to take even the weapons of war and just destroy them to where they're not only no longer needed but no longer usable? I mean, God can do this. And He does this. This is the God who we say is our help. Who we say this is where we find our refuge. This is where we find our security and our safety. It's of the Lord who is in control of everything. And He can do anything. That question that we find in Scripture, that rhetorical question, says this, is anything too hard for the Lord? And the answer is obviously no. Nothing is too hard for the Lord. I want you to consider something. When we are fearful, by our very actions, by the fear itself, we are denying the God who we claim is our help. Think about this. You are either, if you're living in fear and worry and anxiety, you are either denying that God is in control 
or you are denying that God is always good and God is always right. Because if you can say, with all that is within you, God is in control of everything, and God is always good and God is always right, then we have no reason to fear. We don't have to worry about what tomorrow holds or what today holds, because my God, who is always good, is in control of it all. I want you to go with me to the book of Mark and chapter number 7. A phrase at the very end of the chapter has become one of my favorite Bible phrases. Mark chapter 7. Jesus has just healed a man who was, was deaf and dumb, could not speak, could not hear. It says, chapter 7, verse number uh, 36, it says, And he charged them that they should tell no man, but the more he charged them, so much the more a great deal they published it. Isn't it funny? When, when Jesus would say, don't tell anyone about this, it just seemed like they couldn't contain themselves. <laughs> Notice this, verse 37, They were beyond measure astonished, saying, He hath done all things well. He maketh both the deaf to hear and the dumb to speak. The people who were around Jesus and observed his miracles said this of him, He hath done all things well. When fear and anxiety comes into your life, can you say, Everything that God does, he does well. We sing the song, All the Way My Savior Leads Me, and... and one of the things that we sing in there is this, For I know whatever befall me, Jesus doeth all things well. Isn't it wonderful to know that the God who's in control does all things well? He doesn't mess anything up. Nothing has ever taken him by surprise, and he's never said oops, he's never made a mistake. He just does all things well. Therefore, we have no reason to fear we need to recognize where our security comes from. We need to remember His sovereignty. And then, lastly, let me say this, we need to rest in stillness. We need to rest in stillness. Verse number 10 says this, Be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the heathen. I will be exalted in the earth. I love that the Lord points to something that is yet to come, something that is in the future, as He says, listen, you don't need to worry. You need to be still and know that I'm God. And know this, that there is coming a day when I will be exalted even among the heathen. I will be exalted in the earth. Yes, one day every knee will bow and every tongue will confess to God, this is coming. And because of the future... And because you know that you are on the winning side, you can rest, you can be still, you can find comfort and peace in stillness. Be still and know that I am God. When was the last time that you, you took some time to just sit back and to turn off all the noise and all of the things that would distract you and just stop and consider the reality that God is God When was the last time you were just still? And just remembered that God is in control, that God will be exalted, and that we are on the winning side, no matter what comes. We don't have to fear what tomorrow holds. Hey, if you're a child of God, it only gets better from here. The worst thing that could happen to you in your life is temporary. Because there's a better day coming. And we know that we, we are on His side. He's on our side. Be still and know that I'm God. You know, the, the sad reality is that when fear and worry comes upon us, the natural reaction is to numb that, that pain and that, that fear with busyness and noise and things that would, would block out those thoughts. You know, a lot of people are afraid to be alone with their thoughts. 
and there's a constant need for noise and there's a constant need for busyness and and people to be around because there's something about stillness and quietness that causes our heart to reflect within itself and sometimes there's a fearfulness about that but God says just the opposite be still be still and know that I am God I want you to go with me, if you would, please, quickly to the book of Luke, chapter number 10. Luke, chapter 10. Luke 10, we'll begin reading in verse number 38. It says, Now it came to pass, as they went, that he entered into a certain village, and a certain woman named Martha received him into her house, And she had a sister called Mary, which also sat at Jesus' feet and heard his word. But Martha was cumbered about much serving and came to him and said, Lord, dost thou not care that my sister hath left me to serve alone? Bid her therefore that she help me. Listen to Jesus' response. And Jesus answered and said unto her, Martha, Martha, thou art careful and troubled about many things. The word careful means to be anxious or worried or fearful. The word troubled means to be distracted. I believe that Jesus was dealing with an issue in Martha's life where there was some kind of stress or fear. Maybe it was of current events and things in her life or maybe it was just about the need of the hour. You know, Jesus is in my house and and there's work to be done. Whatever the case was. But Jesus looked within her heart and says there's a problem. Could we say it this way? There's a problem with anxiety in your life. And so what are you doing? You're distracting yourself with service. Do you know what a lot of people distract themselves with? Work. Even service to God, ministry, uh, entertainment, you know, TV, movies, music. Uh, it's amazing we, we carry these distraction devices in our pockets everywhere we go. And you see people with any free moment, what do they do? They pick it up and start looking at it. Could it be that there's some distraction there? There's a need to try and not be still. But notice what Jesus said here. He said, you're careful and troubled about many things. Verse 42, but one thing is needful. And Mary hath chosen that good part which shall not be taken away from her. He says, Martha, here's what you need to do. Come sit at my feet. Come sit at my feet. Friend, I am not in any way trying to downplay the reality of what fear and anxiety and worry can do in your life. But I want you to realize that if you want to get victory over that, spend some time at the feet of Jesus. Be still and know that He is God. Learn to trust in Him. Learn to acknowledge Him in all things. One more place I want to turn with you. Psalm 4. Psalm 4. Psalm 4 and verse number 4 says this. Stand in awe and sin not. Commune with your own heart upon your bed and be still. Selah. Offer the sacrifices of righteousness and put your trust in the Lord. There be many that say, who will show us any good? Lord, lift thou up the light of thy countenance upon us. Thou hast put gladness in my heart more than in the time that their corn and their wine increased. Think about this for a moment. We're given instructions to be still, to stand in awe of the Lord to recognize and acknowledge that He is God, that He will be exalted, to commune with our own heart upon our bed and to be still. And then we're told this, that God puts gladness in our hearts. He says, Thou hast put gladness in my heart more than in the time that their 
corn and their wine increased. Lord, there's something about this stillness and this walk with you and this peace that I have in you that's better. Listen, it's better than if you change the circumstances. People rejoice when their corn and their wine increases. Why? Because it means that there's abundance. The economy is doing well. I've got money in the bank. I don't have to worry about where my next meal is coming from. Things are good. But David says here, there's something that God's done in my heart through stillness, through my walk with Him, that He's put joy in my heart that's better than even the circumstances becoming what I think they need to be. It's better than that. And then he says in verse number 8, I will both lay me down in peace and sleep. For thou, Lord, only makest me dwell in safety. Lord, I can sleep tonight. Even though my corn and my wine may not be increased. Even though the circumstances and even... You know, it could be said and others would say to me, Who will show us any good? Where's the good in life? I could lay awake and worry about these things, but I don't have to. I'll lay me down in peace and I'll sleep. Why? Because I know who's in control. Because I'm resting in Him. Because I know that He's the one that makes me to dwell in safety. So I don't have to worry. I read to you earlier, Philippians 4 and verse 6, Be careful for nothing. But in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your request be made known unto God. The very next verse says that the peace of God, which passeth all understanding, shall keep your hearts and minds. You see, if, if you'll trust in Him, if you'll cast your care upon Him, if you'll be still and acknowledge Him, He's promised that His peace will keep you. So the Bible answer for anxiety really is very, very simple. I'm not saying it's necessarily simple to implement because our flesh fights against us and the world fights against us and and Satan whispers in our ear and he whispers lies to us and there's this constant battle. But the answer really is as simple as this. Recognize your security. Remember his sovereignty. And rest in stillness. Let's pray. Father, thank you again for our time in your word tonight. Lord, I pray that you would help us, Lord, really to acknowledge you in all things and to trust you in all things. And in this day and age in which we live that is so busy and stressful and and worrisome, and, and honestly, Lord, so many people really struggle with these issues Lord, I pray that you would give victory over that, give, give comfort and peace through your word, but also, Lord, as we seek to acknowledge you in all things. Help us to take some time each day to just be still, to shut out the noise and the distraction. Help us not to be cumbered about and careful and troubled about many things, anxious and worried and distracted. Lord, help us to be still and to remember that you will be exalted, that ultimately you get the victory in all of this, that you're in control of everything, and Lord, that you are always right and that you are always good. May we be honoring to you in our lives, and even as we leave here tonight, Lord, I pray that we would be trusting in you, walking with you, that we can be a witness and a testimony for you everywhere we go. Bring us home safely tonight. I pray for safety on the roads as we travel home. And Lord, I pray that you bring us back together once again to worship and praise your your wonderful and precious name. We thank you, Lord, for your goodness. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Have a-